Um, yeah, so I'm Rachel Retner. I'm a health reporter for Live Science. And today we're talking about promising research on the use of psilocybin for treating mental health conditions. Um, and so psilocybin is perhaps best known as a hallucinogenic compound found in magic mushrooms. And the drug has an interesting history in the field of psychiatry. Uh, research on its potential uses as a treatment actually began in the 1950s, uh, but was halted in the 1970s after psilocybin was classified as a Schedule I drug, uh, making it illegal. Um, but over the past decade, there's been a renaissance of sorts in the study of hallucinogenic drugs for mental health conditions. Um, in recent years, a number of studies have suggested that psilocybin could provide benefits to patients with depression who haven't benefited from other treatments uh, or to people with cancer-related psychological distress. And um, most recently, I covered a study published in the New England Journal of Medicine that found that psilocybin may work just as well as a common antidepressant drug at treating symptoms of depression. And the study found that people who took psilocybin twice in a six week period under the supervision of psychiatrists showed similar reductions in their depression symptoms compared with people who took a six week course of the antidepressant um, acetylopram. Um, but experts caution that this study and other similar studies on psilocybin have been relatively small. And so more research is needed to confirm the findings. And I recently spoke with Dr. Stephen Ross an associate, the Associate Director of the Center for Psychedelic Medicine at NYU Lagoon Health, um, and who is currently conducting studies on the use of psilocybin for treating mental health conditions. Um, thanks so much for being here today. Yeah, my pleasure. Thanks for having me. Um, yeah, so there's been a number of promising studies in recent years suggesting psilocybin may provide benefits to some people with depression or people with cancer-related psychological distress. Um, and in light of this research, could we see psilocybin approved as a treatment for depression or other mental health conditions sometime in the near future? Yeah, I think it's moving that way. There's um, a couple of advanced research programs testing psilocybin in major depression that are in phase two studies currently and um, looking to head into phase three. And if all that goes along, it could be anywhere from like three to five years for that indication, I would predict. But then there are other efforts as well. Um, I'm leading an effort at NYU to do advanced trials in psilocybin to treat advanced cancer-related psychiatric and existential distress, a follow-up to work that we at Johns Hopkins and UCLA have done. And that's moving forward as well. So that's another potential indication dealing with existential distress at end of life. There is, is the main target. And then at NYU, we also have an advanced research program using psilocybin-assisted psychotherapy to treat alcohol use disorder that Michael Bogenschutz and I are, are leading and finishing up a large phase two trial. And we hope to roll that into phase three. So those are the three most mature psilocybin programs of research. And I think you know one of them will get it um, over the line in the next couple of years, assuming the larger trials show positive findings similar to the other ones. And that's not, you know, we don't know that until we do the research, but it's looking pretty promising. Yeah, and what are some of the um, main questions that you're really looking to answer um, before psilocybin might be approved for one of these mental health conditions? Well, the main thing is we have to see if it works or not. You know, the field is infused with a lot of irrational exuberance. There's a kind of history to that. They were, when they initially launched in the 40s and 50s, they sort of like, similar to what's going on now, became wonder drugs. People thought they were gonna cure everything. And then there was a kind of backlash against them. They escaped from the laboratory, went into the general public and they have real harms associated with them. So the point of doing the research is to look at the risk benefit profile of the intervention, which is not just psilocybin by itself, it's in conjunction with psychotherapy. The idea is, you know, to do larger trials, to see if there's a clear benefit and to see what the adverse effects are and what the risks are. And then, you know, ultimately a clinician using this will have to weigh those. They'll have to, you know, look at the risks, mitigate them. For instance, these are not drugs you want to give to people with psychotic illness, like schizophrenia. So you definitely want to rule that out. Um, they, they really use, you know, in highly controlled settings the way we do it at the hospital. 
where two therapists, you know, a lot of safety parameters. So there's a, a, a kind of way to do it that maximizes safety. And that's our methodology. I see, yeah. And I know that there, quite a few of the earlier trials have been quite small. And so these larger trials are looking to see whether um, we can figure out who benefits most from this treatment versus others. Yeah, in terms of the different phases, you know, phase one in the FDA drug development process is usually like 10, 20 people. It's looking at like safety. Phase two trials are bigger, anywhere from like, you know, 40 to 100 people. And they're looking at preliminary efficacy. Does it seem to work for your target? And then the phase three trials can be hundreds of people, thousands of people. And there, there you can definitively see, well, is it an effective, you know, an efficacious drug? And then the FDA weighs whether the data is good enough to, you know, make it available as a medicine. Given that psilocybin is a schedule one drug of the most restricted category with definition, highest addictive liability, no therapeutic utility, it would have to come out of that category to be prescribed. That makes sense. Um, and what uh, I was also wondering if you could speak about what are some of the potential advantages of, advantages of psilocybin over conventional treatments? Well, if it ends up working, one of the big advantages is, is that you don't have to dose it every day. Unlike a traditional antidepressant where you take it every day, sometimes for years, this is more single dose, two doses, sometimes three dosing paradigms. So the intervention is limited in terms of the exposure to the pharmacologic compound. And so if it, if it works well, it's gonna have less side effects over time because, you know, take the SSRIs, they have a big side effect profile. Upwards of like 50% of people have sexual side effects. They, they sometimes can increase suicidality. So the, you know, a drug that you only take a couple times is what makes this different. Yeah, and some of the uh, earlier research is, is indicating that some of the benefit uh, beneficial effects could be um, quite long lasting. Yeah, and, and finally, um, what would be your message to members of the general public who might have depression or know someone with depression and are hearing about this research? Depression is a horrible illness. We're, we're studying it now. We're, we're involved in these phase two programs for psilocybin for depression. And Depression is probably the worst neuropsychiatric disorder of all of them in terms of prevalence and effect to the individual and society. It's a really horrible thing to be chronically depressed. So in this study, we're taking like, you know, seeing really desperate people who are very upset. I part of the problem is they think they're going to get a magic pill, one dose that'll cure the depression. And that's probably not how it works. So, you know, we're continuing to do the trials with depression. And then ultimately we'll see where psilocybin lands. There was a recent study published in the New England Journal of Medicine that compared two doses of psilocybin to a typical antidepressant Lexapro. And it was kind of like a tie. They both did as well, which kind of like, you know, gave people some pause and, and sort of, you know, a little bit of the ra rational exuberance that it would work for everything. <clears throat> uh, it's good that it works as well as the typical antidepressants. And if you only have to give it a couple of times, then you have you know, a drug that's an improved thing from a side effect perspective. So we'll have to see, my guess is in the end that psilocybin will work for major depressive disorder. Major depressive disorder is a kind of very chronic, um, complicated illness. There's treatment resistant varieties. I think those are going to need more than single dosing. You're going to need a multiple dosing paradigm, but a lot of research still to be done to figure all that out. I see. Um, and a lot of these studies, I think, important to note that um, these uh, psilocybin doses are being given, um, you know, with support of, of therapists as well. So it's a um, very controlled um, setting. Very controlled. Yeah. I mean, our lab is at Bellevue Hospital, you know, probably the best place on the planet to have a medical emergency or any kind of emergency. So it's in a very safe setting. All of the participants get two therapists, very skilled therapists. And they spend, you know, usually six to eight hours before the dosing session reviewing, let's say they have terminal cancer, we'll review their life in great detail, we'll review the history of cancer and how it's negatively affected them in great detail, we will then prepare them for the dosing session and go over what to do if difficult things happen, we'll go over how we keep them safe. The dosing sessions are, are interesting, they're eight hours long, very long to sit there. And in the beginning, we have them state their intention for the day to really focus them on why they're there, you know they're dying or they have alcohol use disorder. Then we give them the pill and they lie down on their back. We give them eye shades. 
the pre-selected music is played. And the idea is to focus eternally. The idea there is to kind of, you know, occasion um, a type of uh, altered state that could potentially be beneficial. Um, and so it's very much not guided. They have their internal experience. If they need help, we sit them up and talk to them and help them. Towards the end of the sessions, we sit them up and start to like look at the content that came up and then do integrative psychotherapy where we start to integrate their experiences and feed it back into their disease state and to see if anything from the experience shifted their orientation towards death, their depression, you know, their, their relationship to using alcohol. So that, that's the model. And that, and that was an old model that was developed during the 60s. And um, yeah, so we have a dosing room here at, at Bellevue and you know, we've been doing psilocybin research here for the last 16 years. Oh, I see. Well, yeah, I think that those are all the questions I had. I, I didn't want to take up any more of your time. Um, thanks so much again. My pleasure. Thanks for having me. Hi, so yeah, as we heard, this is promising research. Um, we might see psilocybin approved for specific mental health conditions in the next few years. Uh, but as Dr. Ross mentioned, we still need to be cautious about this because the trials are still underway. Uh, so we're still awaiting those results. Um, and I also wanted to reemphasize that researchers have warned that people with depression should not self-medicate with psilocybin. Um, so these studies have been done in controlled settings um, and taking psilocybin in an unsupervised setting using an unregulated dose uh, could have negative effects. Uh, good point, Rachel. Uh, thanks for thanks for doing that. I actually had a question myself because, um, you know, psilocybin is also known as magic mushrooms. And so uh, do you need to experience a trip to get the benefits? Is that like how this works? Oh, um, yeah, it's a good question. So researchers are actually looking into whether people need to have a so-called mystical experience in order to um, get benefits from um, psilocybin. And, uh, but we don't actually know the answer to that question. Um, but some, if it's not necessary, some people are looking into um, creating drugs that um, might have the beneficial effects of psilocybin without having the um, hallucinogenic symptoms. Yeah. yeah, I think that's uh, important for some people who are definitely not into that. We have a question from Facebook from Lillian who asks, will this drug be added to the DNA profile for antidepressants that might work for people? What can you say about that? Um, well, I'm thinking, I, I, I can't, I don't know the answer to that, but um, I mean, I know that there is research looking into whether we can find certain markers that are tied to people's responses to um, treatment and including um, DNA markers. But I think we're kind of far from being able to say whether a drug like psilocybin would uh, work based on you know your DNA. I think we're far from that. Yeah, baby steps. But uh, I think so far I've heard it's uh, legal in Oregon uh, as a recreational use, correct, or, med or medicinal? Um, I'm not 100% sure about that. You know, they decriminalized. So yeah, so the, a lot, a lot has to be developed, and and these studies are, are a big stepping stone. So uh, that's really cool. And you know, the the more options that people have for for treating uh, is better. Um, so yeah, thanks, uh, thanks, Rachel. And I just wanted to clarify, psilocybin. Um, is legal in Oregon for therapeutic use. In 2020, Oregon was the first state to legalize psilocybin for therapeutic use in addition to um, having it be decriminalized. Yeah, so does that mean in Oregon that they're gonna be doing most of the federal studies there? Is that how it works when it's legal in a place or can they do federal studies anywhere? I mean, I think you just need to get approval, um, special approval, so they, can, they are doing them you know, throughout the country. Very cool. Very cool. All right, guys. Well, that was our show today. I want to thank everybody for joining us. And um, I think this was it for our Wellness Wednesdays for Mental Health Awareness Month since May is now over. I uh, hope you guys learned something and uh, be well out there. Bye. Bye.